Welcome everybody. This is Simon Turpin of Answers in Genesis UK and today uh, we're going to be looking at the subject of theistic evolution and why it is wrong. And I've got with me Professor Stuart Burgess who's um, professor at um, Bristol University in mechanical engineering and design and Stuart has spent many years doing uh, creation apologetics and so he's well qualified to talk on this today. So he's going to talk on death and Adam, life in Christ, why theistic evolution is wrong. And Stuart will probably mention a number of products um, throughout this talk and maybe even at, the, even at the end of the talk. And just so you know, at the moment that we are doing 20% off all our products if you go to the Answers and Genesis web store. So that's 20% off all things. Um, so. Stuart, I'm going to hand over to you and thank you for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see on the first slide, the, the title of the talk is Death in Adam and Life in Christ. Um, now, those two things in that title, they're two of the most important doctrines in Christianity. Uh, you have to understand that we have death in Adam in order to understand our sinfulness and our need of salvation. But you also need to know that we can have life only through Christ. Uh, so these are two really important doctrines. So what I'm gonna do is start uh, with a couple of Bible verses from Romans five, and then we'll look at how this all relates to origins and Genesis. So on the next slide, we have a very famous verse from Romans chapter five and verse 12 and this is the kind of the bad news in the bible the death in adam because in verse 12 we read through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men and notice how it says death death spread to all men uh, this is quite relevant to today because uh, just a few months ago, there was one person in the world who had coronavirus in China. And amazingly, today, millions of people have caught uh, that virus from one man. But sin is the worst virus of all, because there was one time when one, one person or two people had that, that virus, Adam and Eve, and it has spread to all men. Unlike coronavirus, it's spread to every single man and woman born apart from just one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And sin is a greater virus in that the consequences uh, have been catastrophic. That's when death came into the world. So there was, there was no death before um, Adam. <clears throat> and also, it's important to note, there would have been no animal death before Adam. Uh, it wouldn't make sense for Adam to be living for eternity if the animals were dying. And it's clear from Genesis 3 that as part of the curse, uh, that's when the predator-prey relationship came in to the world. <clears throat> so it's rather interesting that in, in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 5, it's confirming that Adam was a literal person, and it's confirming that God's original creation was a place of paradise. <clears throat> so why is theistic evolution unbiblical? Well, theistic evolution clearly involves death and disease before the fall of Adam. And in fact, theistic evolution involves no real Adam and real Eve. Now, I'm sure some theistic evolutionists would argue that actually they kind of believe in a real Adam and Eve. But if you look into this, if you read books, uh, by people like Dennis Alexander, it's quite clear that if you believe in evolution, you can't believe in a literal Adam and Eve. And what you believe is very much in contradiction with what is taught in Romans chapter 5. But now I want to move on to another verse in Romans chapter 5, now verse 19. And here we see the good news of the gospel. It would be very sad if all we read was that there is death in Adam. 
But in verse 19, we have this remarkable teaching for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. That, that's a, a wonderful verse, a very encouraging verse and a very interesting way of summarizing it. But it confirms that Adam was a real person. That verse would not make sense if Adam was not a, a, a literal Adam. It shows that we've all inherited uh, Adam's sin spread to all men. But also notice a connection between Adam and Christ. Adam, the first Adam, Christ, the second Adam. These are the, the two really key people in history, uh, Adam and Christ. And if Adam was not real, then Christ's work was in vain. Uh, the gospel only makes sense if Adam was a real person. Uh, but it's wonderful to see in that verse that all believers will be made righteous, uh, even though one man's sinfulness, Adam, that affected the entire human race. But in a kind of similar way, one person's obedience, the Lord Jesus Christ lived that perfectly righteous life. And because of his obedience in his life and his obedience at the cross, bearing our sins in his own body on the tree, uh, because of the life of Christ, all who believe in him will be made uh, righteous. So it's amazing how those two people, Adam and Christ, have had a profound effect on many, many people. And uh, that's the good news of the gospel. Well, it's the bad news and it's the good news. If we, if we have true faith in Christ, then we have life in Christ. So that, those are the doctrines in the Bible, the really fundamental doctrines. And that affects uh, how we view Genesis, because Genesis clearly teaches a literal Adam and Eve. Uh, it clearly teaches a literal six day creation. And I want to go through some reasons why this is the correct uh, interpretation. And then we'll look at some of the dangers of theistic evolution. But I wanted to start with Romans 5 to show how this really ties in closely with New Testament teaching concerning the gospel. So why, why was creation then in six days? Well, firstly, when you read Genesis chapter 1, it's clearly written as a literal event. And even more so when you go on to, for example, Genesis chapter 2, we read of very intimate details like the dust of the ground and we read of Eve's, uh, Eve being made uh, from the rib of Adam. And, you know, when you read those details, then you can see that it must be a literal event. Uh, the picture I'm showing here is uh, carved onto the side of a church showing uh, uh, God taking uh, one of the ribs of Adam to make Eve. The church has always viewed Genesis as literal history. But secondly, the Bible has a clear description of the genealogy uh, of Adam, Adam to Noah in Genesis 5, Noah to Abraham in Genesis 10 and 11, and Abraham to Jesus uh, in Matthew 1. So you can go back through this genealogy all the way back to Adam. And that just wouldn't make sense if Adam wasn't a real person. And it also shows that things stop at Adam as well. So that, that, that's an important teaching and evidence. But then thirdly, when we read through Genesis chapter one, we read of morning and evening. And uh, those two things clearly indicate that we're talking about 24 hour days. In fact, uh, in Hebrew, the word day, yom, uh, appears over 200 times in the Old Testament with numbers like the first day, second day. And in every single case, such case, it refers to a 24 hour day. Then we can think of the creation of the stars. In particular, in Psalm 33, in verses eight and nine, it, it refers to the stars being made. And there's that wonderful uh, expression for he spoke and it was done he commanded and it stood fast now when you think of those 
wonderful verses, uh, th th those wonderful words, it's clearly implied that this was something done in a very immediate way. It wasn't taking millions of years. It was done under the con uh, command of God. And that ties in with a literal six day creation. Then we can think of the creation of the sun. Uh, the sun was made on day four, and that only makes sense uh, with six day creation because how could the world survive millions of years without the sun? Uh, whereas it's fairly straightforward uh, to think of the, of the world surviving just a couple of days without the sun. And the earth only needed God's light to shine on it. It didn't actually need light from the sun. Then sickly, we can think of what the New Testament teaches. Uh, and just to mention two New Testament authors, firstly, Jesus himself. He said that Adam and Eve were created at the beginning of creation. We read that in Mark chapter 10, verse 6. And then in Luke chapter 1, verse 70, it says, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. So the New Testament clearly sees the world beginning with the creation week when Adam and Eve were created. And then one more uh, reason. And this comes from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, where it says God created the earth to be inhabited. Now, this is a significant verse because what it means is God's whole purpose in the earth is to be a home for man. Uh, the earth isn't just a planet. God didn't just create the planet to go around the sun, but it was specifically created to be inhabited by man, a home for man. Now, when God has a purpose like that, uh, it's in God's character to make things happen straight away. When you think of Jesus calming the storm, uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, giving eyesight to the blind. These things happened instantly. And so it makes sense that if God wanted to create the earth, to have the function of being a home for man, it makes sense that that would happen straight away, not after millions of years. So those are various uh, uh, arguments for uh, interpreting Genesis 1 as a literal six-day creation as i say that's how the church uh, has has viewed it over the last two thousand years now people have various objections and i'll deal with two um objections uh, one is to as uh, the, the the starlight uh some people say well the uni to them the universe looks old and the answer i would give is this god made a mature creation Adam and Eve were made mature. Perhaps they would have looked 21 years old or 25 years old. They would have been uh, fully adults uh, and, they, and yet they, they were just made. So they were made mature. And not only that, but Adam and Eve were taking fruit from mature trees, fully functioning trees, producing fruit. And it makes sense that the stars would have been made mature and fully functioning. And maybe today we see some of that maturity. We see mature starlight coming to earth. Now, I, pre I appreciate that some people find that difficult uh, to comprehend. Um, but ultimately, it is difficult to comprehend a creation ex nihilo, God creating something from nothing. But it can be helpful to consider the example of Jesus turning water into wine. Now, I've been to a vineyard and I've spoken to winemakers and they've explained that making wine takes a long time. It's a difficult process. You have to crush uh, the grapes. Uh, there's a whole process of fermenting. Uh, there's, there are other processes like uh, aging. And these processes take a long time. It can take easily a year to make a mature uh, fine tasting wine and yet Jesus made wine in an instant he did something that should not be possible according to the laws of physics but he made a mature wine and in the same way God made a mature creation if you want more detail on that there are various uh, books um, by answers in Genesis 
uh, so so you can you can look at those that there's another objection that people make and they say but hasn't science shown evolution to be true uh, the simple answer to that is that science does not support uh, evolution for example there's no evidence for abiogenesis um, abiogenesis that's the theory idea that life could just spontaneously come from a chemical soup and that's been explored for uh, over 70 years now but there is no scientific evidence that that is at all possible and many many scientists are very skeptical that life could just come from a chemical soup it's worth mentioning at this point that there is a big difference between observational science and historical science observational science is something you can have a lot of confidence in but historical science which is based on a lot of speculation uh, that's something that often turns out not to be true and a lot of evolution is based on historical science many scientists would say there's no evidence for macroevolution uh, what darwin observed on the galapagos islands was adaptation and creationists absolutely believe in adaptation like darwin's finches and peppered moths uh, but this is not macro evolution micro evolution involves uh, no new information no new structures uh, it's very limited uh, darwin's finches will always be finches uh, but macroevolution is a different thing and there's no evidence for macroevolution. If you look at a popular biology book, it will mention Darwin's finches and it'll mention the peppered moth, but it won't actually give examples of macroevolution because that doesn't exist. Many scientists would say there's no convincing evidence at all uh, for ape men, the idea that uh, man has evolved from an ape-like creature and many academics will privately admit that there's no evidence for evolution. This is what I have found uh, working in academia over the last uh, 30 years. So that deals with that uh, second objection. There are other objections and uh, you can look at the answers book uh, to answer those various objections. But now I want to just briefly go over some reasons why six day creation is foundational to the gospel. This is why the whole topic of six day creation is so important. It's, it's not a side topic at all. It's, it's foundational to the gospel itself. First of all, it's foundational to the fall of man. It's, it's very sad to read of Adam and Eve falling in sin. This was a very dramatic event uh, it's, it's not a minor event but a very dramatic event in the bible we read in genesis uh, 3 how eve took uh, the forbidden fruit and she ate it she gave it to her husband and then instantly the eyes of both of them were open they knew they were naked it was a very sad event but theistic evolution uh, argues that there wasn't a literal fall and so that undermines the teaching of the fall and undermines the, te the, the gospel because if there wasn't a fall then you don't need that second adam of christ genesis 3 also uh, talks about the curse that terrible thing that happened the fall um, had a big consequence and the consequence was the ground was cursed God had made paradise, but now there was this judgment, which had a profound effect on creation, bringing in the predator-prey relationship. And a theistic evolution says, well, there wasn't a real Adam, there wasn't a real fool, there wasn't a real uh, curse. And so that undermines uh, the gospel because it undermines the need for a savior. And by the way, it also means that according to theistic evolution, God originally made a world with death and suffering. And that's a very dangerous teaching because uh, the most common objection that the non-Christian has is, why would God create a world with suffering? 
now if you have a correct view of genesis you have a, a a pretty good answer to that question the answer being that god didn't create suffering in the beginning he created paradise but it was sin that brought suffering and death into the world but the theistic evolutionist cannot give that answer and, and that is a crucial point but really it comes down to this key point the redemption of man in genesis 3 uh, there is this wonderful hint of the, the gospel uh, i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head thou shalt bruise his heel this is a, a promise of a coming savior a coming messiah but theistic evolution says if adam was only symbolic and not real then well maybe the lord jesus christ he doesn't have to be literal and real and so the gospel is undermined if you don't have that literal interpretation of what happened in genesis uh, 3. in fact we can even uh, mention the redemption of creation in genesis 1 31 it says then god saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good and then in romans chapter 8 verse 22 it mentions uh, the whole of creation groaning uh, because creation was affected by the curse it needs to be redeemed but that wouldn't make sense if god had created originally a world with with suffering and just to mention the words of uh, the, the great bible commentator john calvin he said this about genesis uh, 1 verse 30 verse 31 on each of the days, simple approbation was given, but now after the workmanship of the world was complete in all its parts and had received the last finishing touch, he pronounces it perfectly good that we may know that there is in God's works the highest perfection to which nothing can be added. Uh, commentators like John Calvin absolutely were convinced that God had made that paradise in the beginning before the fall of Adam and Eve. But I just briefly want to mention uh, other problems with theistic evolution. One problem is the witness of creation. In Romans 1.20, uh, another key verse in the New Testament, which speaks of the witness of creation. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse but to put it bluntly theistic evolution says well people do have an excuse because you can't see evidence of design in creation because evolution just by random chance created everything that you can see so it affects the witness of creation secondly theistic evolution undermines the teaching on satan uh, in genesis 3 we we read about how subtle and crafty uh, Satan was, and the Bible actually specifically mentions how subtle and crafty uh, Satan was. But if everything is symbolic, then there's the danger that people do not take the reality of Satan so seriously. Thirdly, theistic evolution undermines the glory of man. In, in Psalm 139, there's that famous verse uh, speaking about how the psalmist praised God because he is fearfully and wonderfully made. But according to evolution, we are not fearfully and wonderfully made. So it undermines that particular uh, verse and, and the glory of man. And theistic evolution undermines the glory of God. Uh, when we think of that psalm I mentioned earlier, Psalm 33, in that psalm, when it's uh, refers to god's power in creation it says let all the earth fear the lord let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him for he spoke and it was done he commanded and it stood fast now according to evolution uh, the universe was just made in a big bang god just could stand back and just let things happen well in that case we don't need to fear god or stand in awe of him so again, you see how theistic evolution undermines this kind of teaching, undermining the glory of God. Just briefly, I'll mention why 
evolution, it's basically an atheistic worldview. Uh, just to give you a quote from a, a quite a famous scientist, Sir Ambrose Fleming, if you studied GCSE physics, you might remember Fleming's left-hand rule. Uh, he's the father of modern electronics, a very famous scientist uh, educated at Cambridge. And he started the first evolution protest movement, which is now the creation science movement. And Sir Ambrose Fleming said this, evolution is essentially atheistic, an attempt to dispense with the very idea of God. So bluntly, he said, this is the whole point of evolution. Um, I've written a book called Hallmarks of Design, and it was forwarded by a professor of microbiology, Anna Ninton, and he was head of microbiology at Bristol University. And he said a very similar thing. He said, evolution is a man-made theory to explain the origin and continuance of life without reference to a creator. So again, here's another scientist saying the whole point of evolution is to support an atheistic world view. And many other scientists have said that. And then finally, I just want to mention the whole spiritual battle to come back to the theological side of things. And first of all, many people have defended Genesis uh, as a literal account of creation. I'm just going to start with some words from the Scottish Confession by John Knox. This was adopted in 1560 by the Scottish Parliament. Um, if you open that book, what you will find in chapter two is this the creation of man. We confess and acknowledge that our God has created man, i.e. our first father, Adam, after his own image and likeness, so that in the whole nature of man, no imperfection could be found. From this dignity and perfection, man and woman both fell, the woman being deceived by the serpent, very clearly believing in a literal Adam and Eve. And it is important to realize that for 2000 years, the Reformed Church has believed in the literal interpretation of Genesis. Um, so if that was to change, that would be rather a strange thing. That Scottish Confession goes on in chapter three to speak of original sin. It says this, by this transgression, generally known as original sin, the image of God was utterly defaced in man, and he and his children became by nature hostile to God, slaves to sin and servants to sin. And thus everlasting death has had and shall have power and dominion over all who have not repented. Very strong language in that uh, paragraph, um, illustrating the profound effect that the fall had it had an immense effect on Adam and the whole of creation, which is why it's important to believe in a literal Adam and a literal Genesis. Uh, then there's the last quote from the Scottish Confession. In chapter four, it says, God made unto Adam a most joyful promise that the seed of the woman should bruise the head of the serpent. That is, that he should destroy the works of the devil. That promise was repeated and made clearer from time to time and it, it's 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 lovely how the scottish confession focuses on this wonderful joyful uh, promise that right from genesis chapter three there is this promise of a coming messiah and right through the bible that promise is repeated this is the most important fact of history that adam fell but then there was a solution a savior was going to come. So you see how the Scottish Confession sees the foundation of the gospel being Adam and Adam's fall and then that gospel promise. I just want to now give you one example from the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland um, in its booklet uh, number 174. Uh, this particular question, what Biblical doctrines does the theory of evolution undermine? And the answer is this, the theory of evolution inevitably undermines the biblical doctrines of the inerrancy of scripture, the creation, the fall of Adam, the nature of original sin, the nature of man, the incarnation and redemption of Christ and the resurrection of the body 
as also many other related truths. Well, that's already a pretty big list, isn't it? So it's a very helpful uh, paragraph from the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, the profound problems with theistic evolution, undermining the very gospel itself. Just a quick quote from John Calvin. He said, I have said above that six days were employed in the formation of the world that he might engage us in the contemplation of his works. It was very gracious of God to create the world in such a way that it gave us that pattern of a, a seven day week. And that, by the way, is quite a strong evidence of uh, biblical creation, because right around the world, people have this culture of a seven day week and uh, the place where that came from is the Bible itself. I just want to mention a point that a lot of people don't realise, and that is that early scientists accepted Genesis as history. Um, there is a book, for example, The Chronology of the World by J. Blair, Fellow of the Royal Society, published in 1754. And he says very clearly in that book, the date of creation was around 4000 BC in, in fact, uh, in fact uh, he's looked into this in detail and he says well it could even be the 23rd of October 4004 BC. Um, probably we don't know the exact date but the point is that special creation was supported by scientists until the end of the 18th century before Charles Lyell came and, and Hatton and Darwin and others. Um, so young earth creation is not a new thing. It was believed by the whole scientific community before around 1800. I've actually got a copy of this book with me. It's actually quite uh, a big book. Here is the book uh, here. You probably can't see any details, but it's rather wonderful having an original copy of that book by Jay Blair. It's a very official book and typical of other books of the time. Uh, so please remember, young earth creation is not some new phenomenon. It was believed by not just all theologians, but all scientists before 1800. But today we have various publications that deny a literal interpretation of Genesis. Uh, one of the most prominent books is by Dennis Alexander. It's called Creation or evolution and it can actually be slightly helpful to read this book because when you read the book uh, you realize the profound problems with believing in theistic evolution you basically as Dennis Alexander explains you have to believe that God created the world with lots of suffering and you have to take the good with the bad the rough with the smooth and there's far more rough than than smooth a lot of people have not thought through the consequences of theistic evolution. And if you read this book, you, you begin to see the, the many problems with theistic evolution. Uh, what is very sad is that the book is supported by J.I. Packer uh, and Julian Hardiman and other modern um, theologians. Another author who uh, supports a theistic evolution approach is John Walton. Uh, when I was studying some theology myself, I had a book called Old Testament, uh, Old Testament Charts, a very helpful book by John H. Walton. This was, that was published about 20 years ago. But in his more recent publications, contrary to what he had in his other books, uh, he's now moving over to a kind of theistic uh, evolution. And so it's very sad to see uh, modern theologians compromising. One thing that I personally find interesting is that there are theologians who are confident in the theory of evolution. Um, that's interesting because I don't know many scientists who are confident in the theory of evolution. Scientists I know will tell me their doubts about evolution. Uh, and it would be good if theologians realized that science is not confident in that theory. But there is a fight back, uh, particularly through organizations like Answers in Genesis. And I would really recommend this particular book um, edited by Terry Mortensen. Uh, 
published a couple of years ago, Searching for Adam, and it has many helpful chapters uh, arguing for a literal interpretation of Adam from a theological point of view, from a scientific uh, point of view. It, it's a really helpful uh, book. As I said earlier, many scientists have said, and others have said, you know, the whole purpose of evolution is to attack Genesis and the gospel. And, you know, the world has a lot, lot of uh, deception in it, uh, right from Genesis to Revelation, we, we hear about how Satan uh, is a deceiver. Um, and sadly today, there are some Christians promoting theistic evolution, like Christians in science and other um, authors and theological uh, leaders. And we see that uh, teaching in the Bible. In Romans 1.25, we read of those who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. There's a great spiritual battle. Uh, either we're going to be believing in God's truth, believing in the true saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, or we're going to have a different worldview, which is going to be the opposite uh, to that. It's rather interesting how Satan deceived Eve in the beginning. He said to Eve, has God really said, uh, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What's interesting today is that Satan is almost saying to us, well, he is saying to us, did I really exist? Because if you believe in theistic evolution, then you don't really believe in that Satan of the Garden of Eden. And so what Satan said to Eve, uh, he's almost saying that to, to even believers today. Did I really say what the Bible says I said in Genesis? Uh, Satan is very audacious in his deception. But I want to finally finish on a positive note and to come back to the good news that we read in Romans chapter 5, and verse 19, that wonderful verse, for as by one man's disobedience, Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. How thankful we should be for the Lord Jesus Christ. He did the opposite of what Adam did. He obeyed and the consequence was just as dramatic as the consequence to Adam's sin. The consequence to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary is that many, and we don't know how many that many is, millions of people are made righteous, which is an amazing thing when you think of the sin, the sinfulness of man, the fact that many believers will be made perfectly righteous, uh, that they can be let into heaven, and enjoy eternity with God. That is the most amazing good news. But you can only appreciate that good news if you have a proper interpretation of Genesis. Thank you and God bless. Thanks, Stuart. So great to see um, the Bible defended and the fact that theistic evolution doesn't fit with what scripture tells us. And you've raised the, the important point that even scientists really reject, many scientists reject um, Darwin's theory of evolution. As I said at the beginning, we do have at the moment a 20% discount on all our products on the Answers in Genesis web store, including the book uh, Stuart mentioned um, from Terry Mortensen on Adam. So please, yes, and a number of other books there you can see on the screen now. Um, please do go to the web store, check those books out and take advantage of the discount. So thank you, Stuart, for being with us tonight and blessing us with that presentation. Thank you.